Your Excellency, Mr. President of the Security Council, members of the Security Council, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the Security Council for convening this briefing on the role of United Nations policing in peacekeeping operations. I am especially pleased to be joined by our distinguished police commissioners in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti and South Sudan. This year we celebrate 70 years of United Nations peacekeeping and this annual event is an opportunity to reaffirm the vital role of the United Nations police play in linking the United Nations work from prevention to peacekeeping to peace building. Today we will hear several examples of how the United Nations police officers perform their mandated tasks while advancing the Secretary General's vision of a transformed United Nations police that is people-centered, mission-oriented, modern, agile, mobile and flexible, specialized and definitely rights-based. Central to this effort is gender-responsive policing. As Police Commissioner Vuniwaka will tell us, gender-responsive policing makes us more efficient in what we do because it helps us to reach the whole population, men, women, boys and girls. One way to contribute to these efforts would be to recruit more women police officers. In addition, women police officers can help to mentor and inspire future women police leaders and thereby increase access to justice for women and children at risk and improve information gathering and analysis by building bridges to vulnerable groups. To reach our full potential, we must bring more women police officers into the fold. In line with the Secretary General's system-wide gender parity strategy, the Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security, and the Department of Peacekeeping Operations Uniformed Gender Parity Strategy, the United Nations Police have stepped up their efforts to increase female participation. More specifically, the police division has developed an action plan that sets out specific targets for female representation in contracted and seconded posts in field missions and at headquarters by December 2028. The police division's efforts are already bearing fruit. The number of female heads of police components in United Nations peacekeeping operations has reached 40%. Increases at all levels of professional posts have also been noted. Unfortunately, despite these gains, underrepresentation at the top persists. To address this situation, the police division has organized female senior police officer command development courses that have helped, identi helped them identify command posts in the police, and they have helped identify over 140 female officers for mid career to senior leadership positions. This initiative complements the police division's ongoing work to establish a senior police leadership roster to identify qualified senior women and men police candidates. Police components in field missions are expected to develop and implement their own gender strategies. Commissioner Vuniwaka will share more details in a few moments' time about UNMIS and the efforts of that team and the mission to deploy gender-responsive policing to fulfill its protection of civilians mandate. Thank you. It is also important for us to recruit officials with the ability to connect with the local communities by using their language. The ability to communicate eff effectively remains a crucial aspect of our work. This includes being able to communicate our mission and intentions 
behind our actions. I appreciate Member States' commitment to multilingualism, and I ask them to ensure that we always have police officials who are genuinely people-centred and centred in the communities where we serve, including when it comes to how we are able to communicate. Second, we will hear how the United Nations police components are increasingly called upon to assist their host state counterparts in addressing serious and organized crime. The growing risk from it have been recognized at the highest levels of the organization, as evidenced by various resolutions of this council and reports of the Secretary General. It is no exaggeration to say it strikes at the very heart of the United Nations core business. Often characterized by porous borders, scarce socio-economic opportunities, weak state authority and prevailing corruption, countries in conflict or emerging from conflict are particularly vulnerable to organized crime. By compromising the integrity of public officials and institutions through corruptions, intimidation and violence, organized criminal groups erode the state's long-term capacity to provide for the public good. This hurts national dialogue and reconciliation, entrenches positions of power, and endangers the entire peace-building process. Historically, organized crime has been a matter for the police, while the military responded to violent conflict. The rise of asymmetric threats and non-state actors has blurred the lines between the two. For example, in West Africa and the Sahel, routes for the illegal trafficking and smuggling of people, weapons and drugs, go through areas controlled by terrorist groups with smugglers and traffickers paying for the right of passage. In Nigeria, Boko Haram has been involved in trafficking of drugs, people and natural resources. This new normal where networks are loser and alliances of convenience are forged requires a holistic response rooted in coherence of practice and approach. Our police components in the Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo and Mali, among others, assist their host state counterparts to set up criminal in intelligence systems and utilize modern technology to prevent and investigate serious and organized crime. They also help improve host state police interactions with the public through community-oriented policing initiatives that have proved successful in Liberia, Abia, and other mission settings, thereby contributing to situational awareness and early warning. Commissioner Abdul Nasir will share more details about the MONUSCO's police component support to the Congolese authorities in this area. Ladies and gentlemen, as we demand more from our police officers, we must, for our part, do more to ensure their welfare safety and security as much as is possible in these increasingly challenging environments. The report by Lieutenant Colonel Dos Santos Cruz on improving security of United Nations peacekeepers laid bare some of our shortcomings in this area and we are committed to correcting them. As one example of this work, the police division has taken steps to standardize the assessment and evaluation of formed police units to improve operational readiness and performance readiness. Lastly today, we will look at strengthening the rule of law through police reform. I would like to cite research conducted by Chuck Call and Michael Barnett in 1999. The transition from civil war to civil society is inextricably linked to the development of civilian police services that uphold the rule of law and help maintain order with the minimum, and I underscore that, minimum amount of force. We have seen many positive examples of this in countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina, El Salvador, uh, Sierra Leone and other countries. Almost exactly one year ago, our peacekeeping operation in Haiti transitioned to a rule of law mission the United Nations Police as the largest component in the mission with almost 1,000 
300 uniformed personnel is the linchpin in this effort to strengthen Haiti's rule of law institutions and also promote human rights. In fact, this represents in many ways a closing of the circle. The United Nations police helped to design and train a new civilian police force in Haiti during what was then the first UN operation that explicitly included police development in its mandate. We are all interested to hear from Commissioner Thierry O from Minujust about how police reform efforts are helping to strengthen the rule of law in the country. The initiative launched by our Secretary General aims to refocus peacekeeping on realistic expectations, make peacekeeping missions stronger and safer, and mobilize greater support for political solutions and for well-structured, well-equipped, well-trained, well-trained forces. It is an acknowledgement that policies and peacekeeping are intervened. The United Nations police already know there can be no such distinction, not when organized crime groups can infiltrate and influence the highest levels of government, and no, not when they remain some of the greatest spoilers of peace. We recently shared our member states the A4P declaration of shared commitments uh, on uh, United Nations peacekeeping operations, an affirmation of collect collective responsibility among the Secretariat, partner organizations, and member states in their various capacities as peacekeeping host countries. Security Council members, troops, police, and financial contributors and donors. As of October 5th this year, 150 member states have endorsed the declaration. The breadth of this high-level political support is a strong endorsement for the department as we move forward. This gathering of our heads of police components will provide critical impetus to the realization of the ideas behind A4P, uh, A4P in the field. As part of the A4P consultations, we heard member states loud and clear. You would like to see peacekeeping forge more unity of purpose and work together across the UN system to ensure greater coherence. UN policing has helped to lead the way in this regard as it has been a founding member of the Global Focal Point, an arrangement which has helped us to break down silos and work towards greater horizontal cooperation among all pillars of the United Nations. In conclusion, this event presents an opportunity to take stock. Over the last year, DPQ and DFS, DFS completed eight independent strategic reviews of different peacekeeping operations. The reviews proved impactful in supporting the increased efficiency and effectiveness of operations by both the streamlining of functions and the realignment of resource allocation. The reviews will help us to strengthen the recommendations of the Secretary General ahead of the deliberations of the Security Council on mandate renewals. This is absolutely essential if the United Nations police are to fulfill their role in not only keeping the peace, but creating the space for political dialogue and preventive diplomacy. It is my hope that today's discussion will help us to further mobilize international support for a United Nations police service that is built for purpose and built for the future. Thank you.